Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me today. Uh, my guest is Doug DeVos, the former CEO and current chairman at Amway. Doug, thank you for joining me. Jacob, great to join you again, my friend. Good to see you. Yes. So a lot of people don't realize that uh, Doug was actually a guest, I think it was 2016, and we were talking a lot about entrepreneurship back then. So it's been uh, four four years and some change. <laughs> Time flies when you're having fun, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, it does for sure. Uh, so I'm actually curious, what have you been up to since then? I mean, when we spoke, I think you were still the, the CEO and you left at the end of 2018. Uh, so since then, how, how have things been going? What have you been up to? Well, you, you know, life goes on. So uh, my wife and I have uh, four kids that are getting uh, to be adults now. So you add a wedding, you know, a couple weddings since then. And, uh, you, you know, life moves on, uh, you know, still staying close to Amway, but a lot of stuff in the community, uh, you know, that, that we really enjoy. Uh, you know, trying to help Grand Rapids be a, a, a better place, connecting with business leaders. So it's uh, it, it keeps me busy. I stay. You know, it's amazing. You can stay busy <laughs> after you transition. Yeah, and you're still involved uh, in the sailing world. I am. Yes, you know that's one of my uh, my passions uh, that I I just can't shake. <laughs> you know, so uh, uh, we, we I, I love to sail. I grew up sailing. You know, on on Lake Michigan with my dad and my brothers, and and it became a passion for me. And we've recently got involved with uh, with New York Yacht Club, and we're trying to go win the America's Cup. Uh, so that competition starts in January of uh, 2021, and and uh, you know partnering with uh, Hap Fouth and Roger Penske and and the New York Yacht Club has just been a great great, uh, a great experience. And so we're hoping that the, the American Magic team can uh, get it done. Yeah, I'll, I'll be rooting for you guys uh, come January. Um, yeah. So uh, for people watching who are maybe not familiar with Amway as a company, maybe you can give us a little bit of background information about the organization, how many employees you guys have, what do you guys do? Sure, uh, a absolutely. Amway's a direct selling company, started about 60 years ago, uh, global in scope today, about $8 billion, a little over that uh, worth of uh, sales globally, about 15,000 employees. But as a direct selling company, we work through a, a, a group of, of independent people who literally own their own business selling our products. Uh, and there's about a million people around the world who do that. Some make it a, a, a full-time uh, business endeavor for themselves, some part-time and many just, you know, just occasional. Um, but uh, that's how our business operates. We have uh, primarily uh, wellness products that we uh, sell, our Neutralite line. Then we have beauty products. We have uh, a variety of other products, over 400 products uh, that we've developed over the years uh, that we sell. And uh, it, it's a it's a beautiful, uh, you know, I, of course, I would say that it's a beautiful business, wonderful people, uh, globe, like I said, global in scope. And that's really a, a, a special part of it, because when it comes to you know opportunity, the Amway business uh, you know, provides opportunity to everybody, wherever they're from, through their own uh, initiative, their hard work. And and that's what my 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 father and his partner, Jay Vananda, believed uh, when they started Amway. They believed that everybody anybody, if given the opportunity, would do something with it. And so they wanted to provide uh, a business opportunity for everyone. Very cool. Um, so one of the things I realized I didn't ask you when you were on the show last time is just a little bit of background information about yourself. So I'm really curious, uh, how how did you grow up? Uh, how did you eventually get to become the the CEO of Amway? I mean, what was it like? You know, your family started this this really amazing company. What was it like growing up? Well, it's a, it's a funny story because my father and Jay were friends in high school. And so, uh, so right, you know, after they got married, they wanted to live uh, together near each other. So we were actually neighbors with the Venando family as we grew up. So, and, and it was a small town of Ada, Michigan, just outside Grand Rapids. So there weren't a lot of other people around in Ada at that time. So Everything in our experience growing up was Amway and be again the nature of our business. We had employee events, we had you know business owner events uh, at the house. So you were just in you know, completely overwhelmed and part of the organization. I loved it uh, from the beginning. So uh, so we would work there you know after uh, after uh, you know, school uh, you know in high school and then through college and then. After after I graduated from Purdue, uh, I wanted to work there full time. And so uh, we did a training program, worked in Europe. We had 
got my wife and I moved to Brussels, Belgium, and uh, worked as a European sales manager uh, there, and then kind of uh, had different roles in different parts of the company, parts, of the company, and and, uh, and then I had a chance to to lead it uh, for a number of years, which was just a, a, a tremendous blessing. Very cool. That's yeah, it's quite a story. Um, so early on, how how big was Amway? I mean, was it like five, ten people that eventually grew to fifteen thousand? It, it was. It was a very small, uh, a very small organization here in Ada, Michigan. Um, it's basically started out of uh, the basements uh, of, uh, of our house and Jay's house. You know, uh, you know, they had a direct selling experience. Dad and Jay did. They were uh, with a, a company called Neutralite selling uh, wellness products. And, and they did that for about 10 years. And then for a variety of reasons, uh, they, they made some changes and started Amway. And they started out of their basements with just the two of them. Um, and uh, and it went from there. So who would have imagined it would have turned into what it is today? And, and the joy of it is, uh, you know, in the early 70s, uh, we were looking for a wellness line and went back and Amway bought Neutralite and really kind of put the band back together again, if you will. So it's a, a great story. Were there any times during the history of the company where, um, you know, you thought maybe the company would go under, go out of business, somebody was trying to take you over? Did you have any like tough, um, tough hurdles you guys had to get through? Well, we've had a lot of tough hurdles, uh, you know, because the, the business model, our, our kind of model of direct selling uh, to a certain extent was unknown. So it was challenged in the 1970s uh, here in the U.S. by the Federal Trade Commission. Was it legitimate? Was it not? Uh, and that was a, a, a huge risk and a huge challenge. And we faced some of that around the world. And in fact, uh, today, uh, Amway China is our biggest market. And after, shortly after we started there in the mid 1990s, we were challenged there. There was a question of the legitimacy of the business model. Obviously, it's uh, been validated and verified uh, there and in, in all markets around the world uh, of how our business model operates. Uh, so from that perspective, there's been some, uh, you know, some stormy weather. Uh, and then we've had some just market challenges where we've had markets that have, uh, you know, had some great successes. We've had some great challenges. And so uh, it's been an ongoing cycle of adjusting and adapting, uh, yeah. but still always moving forward. And what about um, how current events today have impacted uh, the business? Yeah. So, you know, we've been seeing a lot with uh, with COVID, with Black Lives Matter, the, the kind of social and racial injustice that's going out there. Has has this impacted Amway at all? And have you guys done anything? Well, you, you know, boy, uh, you know, the marketplace always impacts uh, you know what we do. Yeah. And I think probably the best way to uh, you know to articulate it is to say. We've always uh, understood who we are and why we do what we do. And so when things change dramatically around us, we have a foundation to go back to. We know we know this. We know what we're trying to accomplish. We know who we're working with. We, we know how to you know, how we want to approach the market. And so the market adjusts and adapts. We have a foundation from which we can move and be agile and, and and still stay connected to the marketplace. So when when these things happen, when you talk about injustice in the world, we go back and say we have provided an opportunity for everybody, anybody, from the very beginning. So we had we can express our values through how we operate, um, you know, because we've been doing it ever since we began. So, yeah. so we don't have to make something up or try to catch up or adjust. But what we do have to do is look at ourselves honestly and say, can we do it better? Can we pro provide a better opportunity for more people that becomes more real? And can we give them better products to sell and better support with technology and, and, and operations? You know, those are the things that we have to challenge ourselves and be honest to say, you know, in some aspects of the business, we could be better. We should be better and we will be better. Uh, and that's how we, we, we want to look at those sorts of things. So, you know, so, you know, and if you take maybe, you know, the health uh, you know, issues of the pandemic and you say, well, we've always been talking about wellness. We've always been talking about prevention. We don't talk about cure. We talk about being healthy and living a, a healthy lifestyle, which would prepare you for this sort of a situation or any other kind of a situation that you may have. So we go back to our values to be able to adjust and adapt and meet the marketplace where it is. That's how we try to approach it. 
Has uh, has COVID impacted? I mean, obviously, direct selling and probably made it challenging for a lot of the people um, with Amway. So, have you guys had to adapt or find kind of creative creative ways to to still be able to to do direct selling? Oh, ab- absolutely! It's 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 changed. You know, uh, virtually uh, everything about how we operate, not who we are but how we operate. We love meetings. Oh, we love traveling the world. We love getting together. We love doing all these fun things together. Can't do that anymore. We love you know, demonstrating products personally, talking with, you know, with customers and, and, and recruiting you know, new people to start their own businesses. Can't do it the same way anymore. So the beauty of an entrepreneurial organization or a business full of entrepreneurs, they adjust quickly yeah. you know they they move because they have to they're on the front lines and because of the nature of our, our our business model we don't have a lot of capital infrastructure that that they have to deal with they buy a computer they they do things differently they figure out online old and young they figure out how to adapt they figure out how to adjust and so our business has transitioned through uh this pandemic pretty successfully. Um, you know, we, you know, we were actually performing better than we had expected uh, before uh, things hit. So, uh, you know, we're, 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 a, we're, everyone's scrambling in our workplace, you know, okay, we're all working remotely. We're doing things differently. Our manufacturing facilities, we all, we had to adapt all of our manufacturing processes in a matter of months, because as I said earlier, we operate in China. We first saw it there. We saw it in Europe. So we've been adapting. And by the way, we've been telling other businesses how we've done it. We've been comparing notes with other global businesses, especially here in Michigan. So what are you learning? What are you learning? Here's what we can uh, do to adapt and adjust. Uh, and so there's no trade secrets. Everybody, and I thought it was a, a real uh, a special aspect of the business community. Everybody was sharing best practices with each other to say, how can we do, you know, how can we make sure our employees, our customers stay safe in this new environment? And uh, so you know, everything's changed, but we've been able to continue to operate. There's a couple of people who are watching live. One person said uh, that their mom was an Amway 50 years ago. Uh, oh, somebody else, uh, Jade, says her cousin brought Amway to Turkey. Um, okay. So you, you definitely have some some people who are watching who themselves or their family members have, have been a part of Amway, which I think is, is, is pretty cool. Wonderful. Um, so it's interesting. You talked about uh, having to adapt. Do, do you have any stories or examples of how um, some of these entrepreneurs have, have had to adapt um, just so that people can kind of get a, a vision. I'm assuming it had to move towards online, towards the internet. Sure, sure. But, but how, I mean, what did that adaptation look like? So, so uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. Just yesterday, uh, uh, Amway Korea would have a, uh, our national convention. We would have it at the, sometimes in the Olympic stadium, we'd get tens of thousands of people. We'd have a huge event. We'd bring in big acts. We'd have, you know, we, we'd have great, you know, entertainment, camaraderie, business content, you know, product expos all around the facility. Uh, so yesterday we did it with a, you know, with a, you know, completely online. I I dialed in from from, from here. Our, our new CEO, Millen Pan, he dialed in uh, from his home. Uh, it, you know, we had other executives that that joined. You know, virtually, uh, we had you know leaders inside the business. They're all joined virtually. It was a, a great studio with a host with with. Uh, TV screens all around behind them. So kind of like if you watch an NBA game, you got people participating on the screens that are around the stage. So it, we tried to create a great feeling again, but that was one of the adaptations uh, that we just had to do. And the other thing is really the move uh, online. As I said, we love the personal interaction, but with from an e-commerce perspective, we've been moving in the e-commerce direction for a long time, but it just took a huge uptick, as mm-hmm. you can imagine, uh, yeah. where everybody really started to use, you know, that capability. It put a lot of stress on us. And, uh, you know, sometimes we weren't as good as we thought we were uh, in, in execution. But um, but those are some of the main examples uh, that we've seen. Well, it seems like you guys had to reinvent yourselves a little bit as well to kind of adapt to this new uh, the new world that we're all a part of. Uh, maybe we can talk a little bit about the leadership component because obviously leading now yeah. behind a behind a screen, you know, you have fifteen thousand people. You said over a million uh, people who are involved with Amway. How do you engage and motivate and inspire 
all these people when you're behind a, a webcam and behind a computer. Sure. Uh, again, the beauty of the entrepreneurial spirit is that they inspire themselves. What we do is we make sure we provide the infrastructure, the foundation. We make sure that the product quality is there. The innovation is there so that when they're representing a product, when they're talking about it to a new customer or prospect, that they can have confidence uh, in, in the work that's behind them. We talked a little bit about the, 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 uh, you know, the technology components and things of that nature. Our job is to make sure that that original idea that anybody can have a business of their own, that everybody should have access to a real opportunity to, to achieve the goals that they want to achieve. And so our, our role is to, is to find a lot of new ways to com keep communicating that message and not just communicating it, demonstrating it by new product introductions, new, you know, you know, new promotional incentive campaigns, new business support operations that we have so that when they see it and feel it, it allows them to inspire themselves because it's always been uh, uh, about them and their goals. They may want a full-time income. They may want a part-time income or something else. Like I said earlier, our job is to help them achieve where they are. And so, so, so however the method is, it's the message, in my opinion, that's the vital part and that we continue to be, you know, laser focused on providing that opportunity for people. What about for people who are not uh, maybe on the direct selling side, but kind of in the back office, you know, people who are running marketing, HR, you know, the people who are more full time at Amway, how do you motivate, engage and inspire those types of team members, because I'm assuming you still have to think about like talent development, leadership development, uh, recruiting new employees. I mean, the, all the traditional aspects of basically running a business. Oh, a, 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 absolutely. And so, you know, the big thing, the big thing in, in that component is to make sure we continue to not only talk about our foundations, but express a vision. Here's where we're going. Here's how we're unique in the marketplace. Here's what's creative and new that you can experience as a, as a leader in the management of a company like Amway. Here's what we can demonstrate. Here's how we can you know, create a, a, a market that's special and new and not only reaches a, a, a customer with a product, but helps somebody have their own business along the way. And then it's, it's through being much more... Um, uh, you know, collaborative and, and actually some of the things that we found in the global business, we can break down a few barriers with technology. Mm -hmm. So we found some ways that we can almost connect more often, stay in touch more often uh, than we would in the past. We would delay things. Well, I'll, I'll talk to you about it when I when I fly over there next month or or some other time because we're so relational. And, and so we've had to learn new skills and new ways of communicating where the company's going, uh, of staying on top of things and working really quickly because the market's moving fast and we have to adapt quickly uh, as well. And, and I'm really proud uh, of the whole management team uh, around the world for what they've done uh, to to adapt again, I've transitioned, so I I, I get to watch and cheer uh, and, and really marvel uh, at, at the way uh, the business uh, has made those uh, adaptations. Were there any uh, new practices or, or policies or, or things that were put into place inside of Amway that allowed for these uh, adaptations? I'm just trying to learn a little bit more about some of the things that you guys did so that uh, other people watching might be able to implement some of those things in their companies too. Sure. We focused on culture. We, in, in fact, what we tried to do is with policies that were in place, we tried to put a pause on them rather than trying to think, you know, top down, here's how we're going to direct it. We're going to trust everybody to understand that we're working in a different environment. Hmm. Um, and, and so one of the things we did is we really increased our communication dramatically. We would do an employee survey every two years. How's it going? What's happening? Uh, we're doing them every 30 days. 
you know, wow. and just quick, quick, you know, you know, quick shots. What's happening in this market? What's happening in that market? What are you sensing? What are you feeling? So we can adapt and adjust and, and really from a policy standpoint, kind of put things on hold and say, look, we're going to trust you to be responsible. We know you're going to work. Um, and you, we're going to have to do it differently because we can't do it the way we were. We're going to trust you to do it. And we've been rewarded dramatically because the productivity has stayed the same or even increased. And we know a lot of people are doing it in tough circumstances. Yeah. Uh, you know, you're, you're working at home in a different environment. It's one thing, you know, in my situation, our kids are grown. They're out of the house. You know, we're, we're fine. If you've got, you know. You I, know I have two kids, a four-year-old and a four-month-old. There, there you go. I'm feeling so, the pain, man. I'm feeling the pain. Not so easy, is it? You know, no. especially in, in some countries where they're not coming back to, you know, going back to school. Yeah. And, and so you don't have that normal break or routine either. So so what we've tried to do from a policy standpoint is say, you know, let's put those on hold. Let's focus on culture. How are we adapting? How are we adjusting? How are we staying focused? And we're going to trust people to be responsible to still stay productive. And, and that's really happened. So what are some of the traditional, I guess, uh, policies that you guys put on hold um, that you kind of said, you know, you don't, don't worry about this for a little while until things get back to normal? Well, you know, vacation policies, <laughs> you know, attendance policies, certainly in the manufacturing space, you know, we have to be a little bit different because people do have to be there mm -hmm. physically. But how they how they uh, you know, how they arrive, how their uh, you know, how their workspace is configured, you know, those sorts of things uh, you know, have had to change. Um, so, we, you know, we've really tried to make sure that you know, that we're addressing everything that they're going to have to have from their side. Uh, you know, uh, uh, so that they feel safe, that they feel uh, rewarded. I think our evaluation systems, you know, again, we've gone, you know, we had annual evaluation systems. We're doing those every 90 days, just more checking in what's working, what's not working. It's really not an evaluation. It's a coaching system. That's the, that's mm -hmm. what we want to have with people. Well, our work, uh, you know, uh, again, in the manufacturing side, the workspace environments changed. We wanted to do that more with the, uh, had planned to do it a little differently on the uh, on the office side, if you will. But COVID has changed all of that. So, uh, you know, so we don't really have a, a physical workspace in the same way. It's more of a, a, a virtual workspace now. Although we are having a, in some markets, some people coming back in from time to time. But it's a different, a, a different workplace. So I, I think to your point, you know, it, it's it's letting people and, and letting people express themselves in a productive and helpful way of business going forward. We've tried to, you know, to a certain extent, let them lead and we can follow and support. So I'm trying to think of just kind of like broad buckets of how you guys have re had to reinvent. It seems like one was a heavy investment in the, in technology, things like e-commerce. Another area was in work work workplace policies and practices. You've had to kind of pause some of your traditional workplace practices, maybe even get rid of them and kind of adapt them. Uh, it seems like another area was around communication and collaboration and, and increasing that. You mentioned going from like doing these surveys every two or three years to now every 30 days. It seems like the performance management system has changed. Now you're doing a lot more, uh, more coaching, doing something a little, a lot more uh, uh, speedier, so to speak. Uh, any other areas or buckets that you think we're missing as far as how you have an organization um, have had to reinvent yourselves? Well, I, you know, I, I think, uh, I think you found big ones out of there, <laughs> out of there. You know, it's um, it, the the only other thing I'd add is, and like I was trying to get to it, just. It's it's a um, it, it it really does get to the cultural side of believing in people. We believe that people given an opportunity can have a business of their own and be successful. We feel the same way with our employees. They want to work. They want to be productive. They want to do well. Um, and, and so when we you know, allow that to happen, you know, we we can follow their lead. Culture is, uh, you know, it's talked about by uh, it's it's everywhere, right? Every company always talks about culture. How do you? How do you guys think about culture internally? I mean, how do you how do you explain it? How do you define it? What what is the Amway culture like? Well, you, you know, we want to start with you know you know start with your heart, right? You want to you want to you want to have this um, you know the, this heart for the business, this heart for other people. I, I remember a, a, an interaction I had with a group of employees once, and we had we had done some program to kind of help communication and foster communication amongst a, a manufacturing team. And they began to say what that meant for them. 
And, and there was one uh, person who said, you know, this, this guy next to me, I couldn't stand him. Uh, it was the worst thing in the world. Before we started this thing, I just couldn't stand working with him. I didn't even really even like him. But because we had to talk, I found out what he was dealing with when he wasn't at work. I found out that his home situation was really tough. He had some huge burdens that he was bringing to work. And when I understood that and I stopped to approach him as a person first before a colleague or a coworker, our relationship has just bloomed. I love this person now because I know who they are. So we want, we want to lead with our heart. We want to have a creative mindset. We always want to be innovative and, and thinking, you know, if I go back to the, 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 the time of, you know, my dad and Jay, again, they would tell the story. It's after world war two that, you know, the world was available to them. They just come out of the service. They wanted to start their life. And that, that enthusiasm, that energy, that we can do it, we can accomplish anything sort of mentality, uh, it, you know, we want to have that a, a, as part of our operations uh, as well. So those are two critical elements, I think, that we spend a lot of time talking about, that we, we really want to, you know, build that culture that we lead with our heart and, and that we have this growth mindset. We're always creative. We're always thinking of new ways uh, to move forward. I love the the leading from from the heart component because it seems like now we need that more than ever. Uh, there are some stories in the media of, of companies that maybe have not been leading from the heart, you know, firing thousands of employees, going through tough times, and then you see other stories of uh, leaders who are trying to be more compassionate, leading from the heart, you know, trying to get their uh, to understand their employees as, as human beings, not just as workers. So I love that that um, that focus of of leading from the heart. Uh, how do you get your other leaders to uh, to embrace this concept? Uh, I mean, is it at odds of like, is leading from the heart, is it mutually exclusive to trying to make money or can you balance both of those things together? Boy, you know, I, I think it's foundational to being successful because in, in, until you, you, you know, you know, leading from the heart doesn't mean you don't hold people accountable. It doesn't mean you don't set targets and goals for yourself or for others. It just means that when you're working with people, you work with them differently, that, that you don't, you're not a boss with a subordinate, you're a leader with a team. And yeah. so your role, you, you begin to think of your role differently of bringing people in. And, and, and I know there's a, a lot of situations where, where, you know, business has been, unbelievably disrupted. And, and and I know there's a lot of business owners that are just broken up because they can't keep their employees in, in their current situation. They just can't afford it. They can't make it happen. And and so that doesn't mean you have that you don't have empathy, that you don't have cares and concerns, but you're trying to balance, you know, some of those sorts of things, but you can still lead with your heart in that process. You'd be you're honest with your employees. You tell them what's going on. You do the most that you can to help them transition through you. You're talking to other businesses that aren't going through the disruption and say, hey, I got great employees that maybe you could hire. We did this years ago when we had a downturn. We just scoured a area in Grand Rapids, we, we connected with as many other businesses as we could. And we said, you know, look, we're struggling right now, but some of those people who were doing really well and said, you know, if you're looking for somebody with this talent or this, that, boy, we, we might have some people who could really help your organization out. And we worked really hard at placing people. Uh, so even though we couldn't provide the ongoing employment that we wanted to, we were still able to invest in them as individuals because just because they weren't working for us anymore, didn't mean they lost value didn't mean that their talent went away because of the job with us. They still had that. That was their talent, their value. They just, we just wanted to help facilitate it so they could apply it somewhere else because we couldn't provide them the same opportunity in those sorts of times. And, and so I see that leading with the heart, uh, it, you know, really doesn't, doesn't take away from accountability or challenge or, or effort or anything like that. I love that message that even during the tough times, even if you can't afford to keep or pay all your uh, people, you can still lead with empathy and, and and help take care of them, even not to use a terrible metaphor, but as the as the ship is kind of going down, you can still make sure that your people are are taken care of and, and they can kind of find safe passage. So I love that. It's kind of like a, a sad metaphor to think of as the ship is going down and you're the captain going down with the ship and trying to help as many people as you can. But 
uh, but it, I think it's a suitable metaphor. Uh, so somebody who uh, is watching live, uh, Leandro was asking, what are your, he was asking about your concerns for next year, but I think maybe we can expand that a little bit broader to just when you, when you look at what's happening in the world now, what are some of the things that maybe you are, are worried about in the world of business um, either, either next year or in the coming years? Yeah. You, you know, I think the, um, the, you know, the, the, the challenges that we're going to face uh, when you go through tough times uh, to me, all come around division. Yeah. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, whether it, if you take it in a global scope, it's, you know, country versus country, it's this country's fault or that country's fault. You know, I'm like, well, wait, you know, hey, let's, uh, you know, let's be careful with that. Or if you look even internally inside the United States, well, it's this group or that group. Well, let's be careful with that. You know, I, I'm blessed to have had a chance to, and I continue to serve on the National uh, Board of Trustees of the National Constitution Center in Philadelphia. And, and, and you find that through the, Const the U.S. Constitution, you know, there, there's a lot of things there. But what it is, is it's an idea and a document that helps bring people together. Not that we have all the answers. We want to be a more perfect union. But it's a place if we'll work together, even if we disagree. And, and there's been a lot of disagreement since the founding of our country. But people found a way to, to work together. Even the formation of the Constitution it took a whole bunch of people all summer long arguing until they found something. But they didn't give up on the conversation. They didn't give up on their future. And, and I think I, I think the biggest challenge for business is to is to continue to apply um, that, that faith, that belief in the future and, and really challenge ourselves to work through whatever the challenges are, but to do it together. Don't blame other people, but figure out how to connect with other people. Say, well, let's, let's, you know, well, let's focus on the, on the problem or the challenge and see yes. what we can do to uh, address it. Um, you know, some industries are going to have a tougher time with that because of what has happened in the marketplace uh, than others. Uh, but, you know, there, there's just nothing, you know, you can't change the marketplace. All you can do is change yourself and how you adapt to it. But I think if we do it from a collaborative standpoint, um, we're going to have a much better shot at getting through to the future uh, than we are if we just, you know, go rogue or independent or, or yeah. start to uh, divide. Yeah, I always tell uh, tell leaders that uh, the, the biggest fear that you should have isn't that somebody disagrees with you. It's that somebody doesn't know what you stand for to begin with. Sure, you and, know. You know, I feel like a lot of business leaders throughout history, they've always kind of wanted to play neutral territory. You know, I don't want to upset these people. I don't want to upset those people. They might be a customer. So I'm just going to kind of play it safe. And now more than ever, a lot of employees want you to take a stance on something. You know, what, what do you believe in? What do you care about? What causes are you fighting for? So I, I think that now more than ever, we really do need leaders who are, you know, not not worrying that people are going to disagree with them, but worry that people don't know what you stand for to begin with. Sure, sure. And, and I, I beautifully said, Jacob, I, I love that. And, and I would I would only add to it that when you express yourself, you respect when somebody else expresses themselves yeah. as well. Yep. Yep. For sure. Um, so you were mentioning that a lot of people were having to, uh, to kind of reinvent and change themselves too. So I kind of wanted to segue a little bit to that on a personal level. Um, but before we jump into that, uh, kind of one transition question for you, and I'm really interested in what does a typical day look like for you? <laughs> you know, I don't know that I've ever had a typical day and, and uh, at, at least in years past, uh, some sort of normalcy. I was traveling somewhere for <laughs> for business or or I was at least going to an office right now. You know, it, it's you know, I'm at home. I go to some, you know, some workplaces, it, it, you know, I and traveling has been virtually non-existent. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, so that's been different. Probably the biggest thing you know, from, uh, from a role in a, in a big organization like Amway, when, when you're the, you know, the, the, the leader there, uh, you know, everything comes to you. Yeah. It's just a flow of information and a flow of work that happens. The biggest thing that I've had to do is think through, okay, now what do I want to do? How am I going to, you know, express myself in a new way? And, it, and you really do have to reinvent yourself and it's hard. 
I've struggled. I, I'll be honest with you. It's hard to kind of get in that new way and, and feel like I, I've, I've hit a stride in any way. I'm still learning a ton and it's been challenging uh, to say, okay, here's what I want to do. Oh, okay. I did that. I didn't like it as much as I thought I would. So I'm going to pivot and now I'm going to start to do this a little bit more. Okay. Well, you know, that didn't work out the way I thought. So now I'm going to pivot. Yeah. So I'm learning all the way through and trying to put together that, um, I don't know if I'd say typical work day, but that work stream. Yeah. What, what is it where I'm going to be thinking and focused and, and collaborating with people, you know, on a subject? How do I take it from things that I might have an interest in to things that I really want to focus on? Do you have a regular um, either routine or daily practice that you do uh, consistently? You, you, you know, the, the the one thing I try to do, especially with all of, of COVID, when we were working from whatever, say, I'm at least going to get up in the morning. I'm going to take a shower. I'm going to clean up and and pretend like I'm going to work somewhere, even if I'm just you know, you know, you know right next door to you know, right in the house, you know, or, or whatever the case is. But, um, you know, I, I think the, the the main thing is to wake up and try to engage your mind. You know, and what are you thinking about? What are you doing? So you, you, you do create that process of I'm going forward. What's what plan am I working? Even if I have to adjust the plan, I'm going to get up and, and, and here's my list. Here, you know, here's my tasks, you know, for the day. I think those are some of the routines that I that I try to uh, stick with. And, and again, I'll be honest, I'm trying to create, you, you know, uh, as you talk about reinventing it, you know, these are, you know, these are, are not simple things and everyone's going to do it differently uh, in, in their own way. Um, but I think getting to a few of those things where you can take a step forward or two steps forward, maybe one step back, but you're, you're still going in a direction and still have that, uh, that ultimate goal or target that you're working towards. What uh, one moment or, or situation do you think has most impacted your approach to leadership? Uh, any any stories or scenarios or, or situations come to mind? <laughs> well, <clears throat> there, there's a fun story uh, that, that pops in my mind when you when you when you say that, and I, I've reflected on it often. Um, <clears throat> we uh, at Amway we got involved uh, in in our down in our community in the downtown area, and and this was a number of years ago. We got involved with a developer, and we there was a building that was built. Um, we were kind of behind the scenes and this developer was up front, but uh, as you can imagine, everything went wrong. Uh, you know, the, the sides were falling off the building, the, the toilets didn't work in this building. It was a, you know, one of the bigger buildings in, in our city and it, it was a disaster from every uh, you know, perspective. And uh, there was a question, what do you do? Okay, the, the developer left, we were kind of stuck with it. And we had a, a meeting with my dad and Jay and the, the Venando family and our family. And there was two presentations. One, you could, you know, just pursue the insurance route, you know, call it a day, get the insurance money, take, you know, for, forget it. And the other one was invest in it, take the risk and, and move forward. Um, and some of us in the second generation, some of the kids at the time said, oh, well, let's just go with the insurance and, and take it down. And we're going to call in Hollywood. We're do a Bruce Willis movie, or we'll do something, you know. And we're just going to, you know, create, take it down, and that's it. Call it a day, and and make it, you know, make a party out of it. Uh, that did not go over well uh, with my father and Jay. And, and as we were kind of laughing and joking, they were quiet. And, and my my father stops as, and kind of got the attention of all of us and said, "Jay, what do you think?" And Jay was at the end of the uh, of the table where we were talking, and he just was shaking his head. He goes, "No, no." He goes, "We don't blow things up. We build things up, hmm. and that's what we do. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to build. We're going to go forward. And if even if it went wrong, we're going to figure out how to overcome it." and move on. And I think about that often because there's been a lot of things in life and in business that go wrong. And the temptation would be just to, to bail. And uh, I think the leadership example that, you know, that Jay set with that very simple message, we don't do that. This is what we do. Uh, I, I reflect on that often. I love that story. That's awesome. Is, is the is the building still around? It is. The building's still around, still functional, operating uh, operating much better, but it did have to be rebuilt. 
Wow. So you guys did uh, kind of go all into it and, and, and fix it up. Yes. Yes. We went into it and fixed it up, redid it and uh, a number of other things in the area there ultimately, uh, you know, since then. So this was in the, gosh, this would be in the, you know, in the early nineties. Uh, and so since then we have continued to, uh, to build on that. And, and that's the message that, you know, that, that Jay and my dad uh, sent to us. And that's the one that they lived was, you know, we go yeah. forward, we build things up. Today, with uh, all the uncertainty that's out there, um, I mean, I know uncertainty is just kind of a fact of life, fact of business, but right. a lot of the people that I talk to, it just feels like things are a, a little more uncertain now, moving a, a little bit faster now. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I mean, you've been a leader for a very long time, and it seems like in the past, as a leader, you had a little bit more luxury to kind of see what was going on. You had a little bit of a playbook, a little bit of a blueprint, like you had more of a um, kind of a, a path to know what to do. Sure. Whereas now things are changing so quickly. You, you have no compass, you have no blueprint. You, you got to kind of make the path yourself. Right. Um, so first, do you agree with that? And second, how do you lead in that kind of a world where you can't see uh, forward? I, you know, you know, Jacob, you're, you're spot on. It is really uncertain today. And one of the things that you could do in the past, you would say, well, okay, here's where we've been going. I have a reasonable idea that we're going to keep going in that direction. You may have a plus or minus 10% variation on that or something. Yeah. Um, but, but the variations today, uh, you know, are just so dramatic. You know, I, I think you, you, you lead then from the inside out. You know, you start with your values and your belief systems. What do you believe in? And then you figure out how to apply it to those changing conditions. Um, you, you know, we, we would have to do that on, on a regular basis to say, what what do we believe in? Because your belief, your belief system, whatever it is for you, it is going to drive a, a set of behaviors, in, in my opinion. So when you believe something, you're going to go in, in a direction and then you're going to make adjustments, uh, you know, to the uncertainty. Wow, didn't see that one coming. Um, but here's how we can turn this challenge into an opportunity, uh, or, you know. And and here's how we can, you know, move and, and you know and minimize the bad or or, or maximize the good uh, in whatever change is happening. But you are spot on. It is it is not simple. But that and that's why I would I feel going back to who you are as a person, uh, if you're in a leadership position with an organization, who are you as an organization and, and why do you exist? Start with those questions. Why are we here? And, and then you can say, okay, what are we trying to accomplish in this environment? And, and then you can really get down to the variations of, well, how are we gonna do it when everything's changing so fast? That's mm -hmm. when you believe in your people uh, and the teams around you who, who are gonna you know, just try to figure out how to come together and find solutions. What happens if you make a mistake? Uh, have you ever made uh, a, a big mistake or a bad choice at, at Amway that that uh, you know cost the company? I mean, how how do you deal with that when you do make a, a mistake or fail? Uh, well, uh, there's so many I can't count, right? <laughs> you know, uh, you know. So mistakes are learning opportunities. You know, you fess up to it. You understand it. You know, how did I get into this? What did I do? What did I miss? you know, what did I think about, uh, you know, is, you know, I, I, um, I really try to shy away from blaming somebody else for something that goes wrong, uh, mm -hmm. you know, for, for what I've done. Um, you know, there's a, a funny story. We had a local uh, business leader who struggled with that. Whenever something would go wrong, he'd have to have somebody to blame. And one of his management team said, look, I will be the, I will be the source of your problem. So don't just get mad, just blame me. And so in their management meetings, he, as soon as something would go wrong, he would get furious. And then he would, the guy would go, it's all my fault. And he'd go, you're right. It's your fault. But then he could get beyond it. So <laughs> whatever system works for you, you know, uh, move on. But you know, every mistake we try to look at, in fact, we, it didn't work real well, but I actually tried to uh, find a way once to, to, almost recognize and celebrate mistakes for the learning opportunities that they presented. I couldn't get a lot of people to say, Hey, by the way, let me tell you what I screwed up here or what I screwed up there. But, but for myself, you know, I, I just tried to be honest about it and, and tried to learn from it. 
um, and so that I, did, I just didn't repeat them. And so that the next time you could make a better decision. Does going, one come to mind for you that a uh, particular mistake or, or failure you had? Gosh, you know, I, I'll have to, uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a simple one, but hopefully it's indicative. In, in uh, Europe, in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, the wall was coming down between East and West. Our business in West Germany was expanding into East Germany, uh, but we were in, in exploding. It was just growing like crazy. People were looking for opportunity. They're looking for products from the West, and, and we couldn't keep up with anything. Uh, we were scrambling all the time. And so as soon as we got a product shipment in, you know, we were just trying to get it into, you know, get it out, get it delivered as quickly as we could. Uh, and, and we didn't check the validity of the truck driver. So we had a whole shipment of product that we got in, put on a truck and sent into East Germany and never saw it again. <laughs> you know, it, it's a simple one, but it's okay. Did we do our homework here? You know, did we did we know who were, who the shipping company was? Did we think about the guarantee? We're all just scrambling. Okay, so so maybe you can you know you can allow it uh, in that capacity. But so um, you, your stuff. it was it was just gone. <laughs> so usually, I, I think um, you know mistakes would be when I, I was trying to react or when I didn't have a good grasp of the, uh, of the situation. An another simple one that, that comes to mind. You know, these aren't huge ones, but they do come to mind because they represent just silly things that I did. I, I was in, I, I was responsible for our special events department many years ago in my career. And, and uh, there was a program and I was backstage and I didn't know that they had changed the program. And there were people backstage that I thought were supposed to be on stage. So I grabbed them and pu literally pushed them on stage. You have to go. You're on stage. You're on stage. And I pushed them out there and, and they kind of walked out wondering. And, and the, you know, the manager looked at me and goes, uh, Doug, we changed the program. Uh, they're not supposed to be on stage, but we'll adjust, you know, we'll make it work. And, and I just kind of sulked away and went, okay, I, I promise I won't do that again. You know, those are a couple things that come to, <laughs> that, that come yeah. to mind. You know, I think some of the, the bigger mistakes, some of the strategic mistakes, generally, you know, if we missed an opportunity in the marketplace, I think we didn't, you know, we didn't transition probably, if you go back to the early days of e-commerce, we didn't transition as quickly as we could have or should have. I think those are the biggest things where we were maybe timid, uh, or didn't experiment uh, as much as we could have. Uh, it, you know, I think that's one where if you look at our history, we're a little bit behind some of the, the, the technology that we needed. We've mm -hmm. worked really hard in recent years to catch up, but that's another one that I think was a big, uh, a big issue for us. Those are, those are awesome stories. I love those. Um, so in the last few minutes that we have left, I wanted to talk a little bit more about uh, personal reinvention, because as you know, there are a lot of people out there that are struggling, you know, sure. business owners. I know a lot of people who got laid off from their jobs and a lot of people are having a little bit of a soul searching moment and trying to figure out, you know, what, what do I do? Yeah. Do you have any advice or, or suggestions or recommendations for people that are kind of at that point right now where they're trying to figure out if they should reinvent themselves and if so, how, I mean, how do you, how do you think through this? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the first thing I would say is just because a, a job or something has changed around you doesn't change your value. Mm -hmm. You have value just because you are who you are. You have gifts, you have talents, you have skills, uh, and, and you're just trying to then find the next place to apply those values so that you can be rewarded as well. So you have a fair exchange of value that for you're providing and reward that you're receiving. Um, and, and then I would take an expansive view of that. I would consider alternatives that you maybe didn't consider before when you were in a place of comfort. What's outside of your comfort zone uh, that you may have thought about, but you may have thought was too risky before? Uh, you know, boy, you know, that would be fun, but I, I've got a pretty good, you know, gig going right here and I don't know if I want to go there. Uh, you know, I, I think that, you know, that when you find yourself in that position, you know, you, express yourself with a, a level of confidence that you're going to find your way forward. Don't feel stuck. You know, you know, my, um, my, my father, you know, grew up in the, in the great depression in the United States. And he shared an experience years ago of watching his father, my grandfather, uh, he had lost his job. He, they had lost their home. They were living in their, his grandparents' home. And, and 
there was a, a young man at the door selling something and he watched his father have an exchange with the young man. And the young man was saying this, you know, a young boy was saying, sir, I have to sell this. It's the last item I have. I, I can't go home until I sell this. And it, he said, it only costs a dime. And, and my dad had to watch his father look at the young man and said, son, I'd love to help you. I'd love to buy that, but I don't have a dime. Mm. I can't help. And, and he saw the distress that my grandfather was feeling, but then he relayed that how my, how my grandfather would always tell him, he goes, someday we're going to get out of this. Someday I'm going to get a job. Someday we're going to get our house back. It's going to get better. Yeah. He never allowed himself with his attitude to be stuck. He was going to move forward. So, you know, with a belief in yourself and then engage your mind in maybe an area where you hadn't thought about before of taking that risk and then start the process. And you'll probably have a few failures. A few things won't work out. You won't get the next opportunity to come your way that you were hoping for. But, you know, if you keep at it and you keep that attitude strong and you keep working at it, I, I, I'm going to put, uh, I think we People put their money on on people who are trying to find their way forward, even in tough situations. Where does that positivity come from? Uh, you know, I mean, I mean, for yourself, for your dad, your grandfather. You know, during those tough times, how how do you stay positive in tough times? Uh, is this just something that you're you're born with, or are there like practices that you can do? Uh, I mean, how do you keep looking at the bright side? Yeah, that's a, that's that's a great question. I guess it's. Um, I guess it's his experience, you know, you know, dad would share his experiences of the things that went wrong, but also the things that went right. You know, it's this sets of adventure that, that the, it's not always going to go well, but if you keep moving forward, you'll be okay. And, and the, the, the story that the experience that they shared was uh, again, after world war II, they started a flight school, but neither one of them knew how to fly dad and Jay, they just wanted to be into business. And, and then after that, they sold that. They bought a boat. They wanted to go to the, you know, they wanted to go to South America. So they'd never been on a sailboat before. And, and they found their way all the way down the East Coast until they got off the coast of Cuba and the boat sank, you, you know, <laughs> but they didn't stop. They kept going. So it was these stories of, of, of determination and persistence that seemed to turn out well in the end. And that's been my experience in the end. Not that life is without challenge. Of course, there's challenge. Of course, there's tragedy. I, I've dealt with it. You've dealt with it, Jacob. Everybody deals with it. You yeah. lose a loved one unexpectedly. Something happens that you didn't, you, know, you didn't plan, and it's crushing. But you just have to keep moving forward. And and and, you know, my experience and putting it in the context, I've seen people move forward from really really tough circumstances uh, and find a better a better future. And it's a lot better to keep that pursuit alive than to just stop and feel stuck. Yeah. I mean, if your dad would have, uh, would have stopped, I suppose Amway would have never been created right after the boat sank, uh, the flight school didn't go well. He could have just been like the hell with it. I'm never going to amount to anything. I'm just going to, you know, leave it there. It, it, exactly. You know, all those challenges, you just keep moving forward. And, and uh, you know, that's that's why it, it's not hard to stay positive. It's a lot more fun to stay positive <laughs> on, the, yeah. on the other side, too. You know, you you just roll with it and you because you're always finding the next solution. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's the next solution? Keeping keep your mind engaged and, and uh, uh, keep trying to find that solution. Well, I think that's a classic example of a growth mindset, because people with a fixed mindset, um, you know, if the boat sinks, you think I'm done. Right. Uh, the flight school closes, you think it's game over. Part of having a growth mindset is viewing those things as uh, obstacles, as challenges that you have to overcome, not as permanent, you know, permanent uh, um, situations yeah. that you're kind of stuck within. So yeah. I think that's a very classic example of, of, of what having a growth mindset means. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, barriers are real and a lot of people face them and, and, and I, I get it. Um, and it's just having that growth mindset to say, how do I find my way over, around, through, under? You know, how do I find my way around this barrier? And, and I, I know those aren't easy uh, discussions to have, but, uh, you know, I, I think that when you keep trying to do it, you're going to find your way forward. Yeah. And you got to have a little bit of, uh, it seems like courage, be, be willing to take some risks. But I know for a lot of people who are in the process of going through reinvention, uh, it sounds like your, your advice is you got to get to try it because you're never going to know until you do it. Yeah, it, it, exactly. And, and again, I don't mean to minimize the challenge. Uh, you're 
probably going to have a, <laughs> a a night or two when you just uh, you know when you want to pack it all in. But you know what? Get up the next day and keep moving forward. Yeah, no, I think that's great advice. Um, so the last other thing that I wanted to touch on, uh, I know you guys have been doing a lot of philanthropy work. I think in the last five years alone, your family gave away probably 529 million. I read it was over a billion dollars so far in total. Um, so I kind of want to get back to this idea of, of a leader and the importance of not just positively impacting your business, but also positively impacting the community and the world at large. Why do you think that's so crucial? Why are you and your family uh, giving so much back? Well, it, 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 it's an expression of, 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 a, of a belief system, you know, from our, our faith and, and the belief that, uh, you know, when, when you're blessed, when you've been given much, then much is acquired and, and that there's an opportunity to share and help others that you should take advantage of that opportunity. You should uh, share and you should help others when you have the capacity to do so. Uh, and it's in a variety of ways. It, it, it's financially, it, it, as you said, our foundation. But there's a lot of people that we work with who volunteer, who serve on boards. They give time talent and treasure. It's the, it's the trifecta. And so we believe that it's important to do that. And we believe we can offer a perspective that can be helpful as well. It's not just the financial resources. I think it's, you know, it's applying some of the business things or the life experiences that we've or seen and shared as well. How do we, you know, how do we engage in our community in a way that creates more opportunity and removes the barriers, you know, we talked about the barriers earlier uh, and, and they are real. So in the areas of whether it's in, you know, the, if you kind of take the institutions of society, you know, the community and government and business and education and kind of, you know, for that kind of, you know, call themselves out and you say, what are the barriers in, in, inherent in those institutions? How do we work together? How do we find the right solutions? And so we can think outside of our business and in, in, in our community in, in a way that applies the same innovation, the great growth mindset, the leading with your heart sort of idea to some situations where, you know, where maybe people haven't experienced that before. Mm. And so if we can be helpful, we believe that we should. Um, and we're always trying to apply the same business principles to that. How, if we're going to help, well, you just write a check and walk away. Or we can say, let's let's put all of our resources, time, talent, and treasure together and say, what can we do to really be helpful? Who else can add to this? Who else can be part of it? How, what, what's the role of these institutions in society uh, that, that can be helpful in the community? So we increase opportunity and decrease barriers to opportunity. And then we're going to believe in people. If we can, as a society, kind of have that shift, if you will, more opportunity, fewer barriers, we're going to believe that people are going to be able to do something with it Kind of like we started with in our uh, you know, our experience at Amway, we believed if people had an opportunity, they'd do something with it. I love the time, talent, and treasure. That is uh, that is a great one to remember. Uh, so I think as, even as a leader, if you're if you're listening or watching this, that's something that you can remember too. Give your time, talent, and treasure to uh, to people you work with, to communities that you serve. Um, that that's wonderful. Well, Doug, where can people go to learn either more about you, your family, Amway, anything that you want to mention for people to check out, please feel free to do so. <laughs> well, you, you know, it's kind of funny. I, 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 I'm a little private. You know, check us out. You know, anything, you know, the all, all the social channels that uh, that Amway has. You know, I, I, I am on Instagram. Uh, you know, so I try to uh, be a little bit visible, share share a little life there. But um, you know, I think the the, the biggest thing is you know, that uh, that people, your all your viewers, listeners, you, you know, find out, you know, search out the examples. I think Jacob, I send them all to you because you have the connection and access to resources to lots of different thoughts, lots of different people. Uh, who can add uh, to their lives. And so I, I would turn it right back to you. I think you do great work to explore these areas uh, and to share stories and, and create for your viewers and listeners um, you know, uh, access uh, to some you know different thoughts and maybe different thinking that can be helpful to them. Well, thank you very much. I, I really, really appreciate that. 
Um, and thanks again for taking time out of your day to share some of your, your insights, your words of wisdom. I love the stories that you've shared from, from your dad, your grandfather, from your own life. Uh, I think that's really where people learn the most from is, is from these stories. So, so thank you again for taking time out of your day. Great. I, I love it. It's great to, great to connect again and uh, appreciate, uh, appreciate what you do. Fun to, fun to have the chat. Yeah, likewise. And thanks everyone again for tuning in. My guest again has been Doug DeVos. He is the former CEO of Amway, the current co-chairman. Uh, make sure to check out um, some of the work that they're doing. It's, it's really been fascinating. And I will see all of you next time. Thank you very much.